Well, we bring ourselves down to another week. Um, I think cousin number two had his funeral service last week. We knew it wasn't going to end pretty. Um, Because even if you somehow miraculously win out, because I know you have one win, and I think we have five games left on the season, including this one, that would bring your record to six and something. And I know Andre's got five wins. As much as I don't like Andre's team, I don't think he drops that far into the standings. That'd be one of the biggest miracles of all time. Um, so things are kind of uneasy. Andre realistically has like a three-game lead in the division, although it might go down to a two-game lead if he starts dropping in the division race. Interesting, when I looked at this matchup, now Andre, I know you're very notorious of setting up a bad lineup first, so I pick against you, but... Based off of what I'm looking at, I don't think that's the case here. I think you're dealing with some buys, some injuries, and matchups alone have swayed you off of certain guys. So I think that's realistically what I think happened. So it's very interesting to see that Allen is kind of a favorite. Now, I know I sound like a broken record, and I think I've said this since September and October. Now we're in November. This is when Allen loves to play spoiler. Is this time his... We haven't seen his full potential, but then again, he's getting Michael Thomas back. But guess what? Now Kenny Galladay is hurt. So I don't know how much firepower we're going to see out of uh, Allen in this one. Um, but yeah, this is, still doesn't look good for him in his case. So Andre, who knows? Maybe you can pull something out. Roethlisberger against Bridgewater. I'm actually going to side with Roethlisberger on this one. Uh, Dallas's defense is, is just awful. Um my only concern with Big Ben, he really hasn't looked that good from statistics at all. But the one thing that I will say is this is a matchup where I think even if he threw three picks, it wasn't it won't matter. He'll have like three touchdowns or something like that. My thing with Teddy Bridgewater is he looks like a guy you could stream, but I don't think he's a quarterback I could trust in fantasy football purposes. Um, his numbers are just so sporadic. It's like 21-8. 16, 30, 24, 9, 23, 14. Like, and even in some solid matchups, he really hasn't delivered. I know going on the road in Kansas City legit looks really nice, but I think he doesn't have a lot of upside here. Even in blowout garbage time, maybe, I still don't see it from him. I think Ben has 30 point potential. If that's a big if, because like if they get out to a lead, it could be the reserves. I'll take Ben. Robbie and Terry McLaurin, which are both in intriguing matchups. Julio and Brandon Cooks, who are also in good matchups. I'm actually going to have to go with the workload on Andre's side here. Um, Cooks against Jacksonville the last time went off. Julio Jones without Calvin Ridley, if he's healthy, should get a lot of targets. When I look at Robbie Anderson and Terry McLaurin, I think Robbie and DJ, this this looks like a game where they're going to have to heavily involve both of them. Robbie Anderson's been very quiet. The opportunity is still there, but I think in terms of him having a, like what you call a quote unquote game, very quiet the last few weeks, nine points, 10 points, seven points. I think this offense is starting to kind of realize that you got to mix and match both. This whole Curtis Samuel thing, believe it or not, this is something that we didn't pay attention to because we were so focused on Robbie and DJ. I think Curtis Samuel is really starting to become a pain for both of their values because he's becoming a gadgety type player. Um, Robbie, I think, would have the better game. I don't know. I, I, I've missed. I, I only called Robbie Anderson having a dud against the Chicago Bears, but I don't know how this matchup would affect him. I think... He obviously has the burners, but they don't use him. They use DJ more, uh, more than they do for Robbie. I don't think it's going to be a dud game. Terry McLaurin is definition of safe. I've mentioned that he's like this year's DJ Moore. He's literally always in the teens. He can sprinkle in an occasional 20 point game there. So, um, I, I, it's tough, but I, I think I'll go with Andre because of Julio Jones and Brandon Cooks in a very solid matchup. Running back wise becomes very interesting because you have two guys that are trending up and you have two guys that are trending down. So Todd Gurley, David Montgomery, um, 
just watching this guy fall into the end zone, obviously I'm speaking with Todd Gurley, it's it's hilarious. Because I think Andre's got the opposite backs, which I, for the record, I don't think both are that good. But Todd Gurley, you know, gets touchdowns where Montgomery gets volume and doesn't score anything, which limits his upside. Dobbins is trending up in the right direction. If Mark Ingram is ruled out, uh, he looked really good. So I think you can bank on a similar workload there. DeAndre Swift, don't know what happened last week, but I would stay the course. This is your classic, okay, where was he last week kind of thing. My only concern is it looks like Kerryon Johnson is going to be that guy in the catch-up role if they fall from behind. Swift really doesn't have an established role on this offense, and I think he's kind of stuck in a weird spot. But I think talent-wise, eventually this will kind of pick up if Matt Patricia gets his uh, shit together or whatnot. Um, can Ty Gurley score against the Denver Broncos? Probably. David Montgomery against a very soft Tennessee defense, but like this guy legit does the bare minimum every week. He, he literally, like, I don't think I've ever seen a running back get like 20 plus carry or 20 plus touches around 20 touches and only get like 10 points. I don't like either of these running backs, but considering that I'd bank on a Todd Gurley touchdown, I'll go Andre. Logan Thomas versus Ebron. I don't know. I don't care. I think Ebron has actually looked pretty solid, but he's not getting a lot of targets. But for a tight end, tight end is kind of dead. I'll, ch- I'll choose Eric Ebron. Gibson, Shark, Melvin Gordon, Jordan Wilkins getting the start. Uh, first and foremost, let's talk about this Jordan Wilkins situation. I am kind of not trusting that. I know I blew all my budget on Tromaine Pope over Jordan Wilkins. Wilkins, to me, is going to be an unpredictable guy. I think on paper we we see what he did. John, Jonathan Taylor looks bad, and he is a little nicked up. I don't think this is going to be an IR stint for Jonathan Taylor. I think that hindsight would tell you that they re- legit wanted this guy to be a backup this year. He got forced into a, a, a heavy workload once Marlon Mack went down. Now, what does that tell me? What does this have anything to do with Jordan Wilkins? I look at Naheem Hines. I say to myself, okay, this guy is going to be the guy who is the third down guy. I mean, we all knew his role was going to stay the same. But it's going to be a hot hand approach now, I feel like, between both Wilkins and Jonathan Taylor. Logic would tell you that Wilkins has looked a lot better. But I don't know what happens with Jonathan Taylor in this whole situation, which is why I don't want to rely on a three-headed monster. But Wilkins is kind of the guy who can be... He's not good, but he can do the third down role okay, and he can do the lead guy role okay. But all that being said, I I don't trust him in in Baltimore. Melvin Gordon is a guy who people are going to sleep on in this Atlanta Falcons matchup. Lindsley, look, I'm a big Lindsley guy. He's looked better as a running back. But Melvin Gordon keeps getting all the goal line work. He keeps getting all the touches. All Lindsley's value is because he's breaking off these long runs, which is why love the player. I don't love his situation because – in order for him to return value, you got to rely on a breakaway. Alan, you got Antonio Gibson and DJ Chark. I think Gibson is in a he's in a decent spot, but the more and more we see JD McKissick get involved, I kind of have to steer back a little bit. Uh, Giants middle of the pack defense are really not that bad to be honest. DJ Chark, who knows? Chark has kind of expressed frustrations that he's not doing well because of Gardner Minshew. Now, Minshew's not there. I don't know anything about this quarterback that's throwing him the ball. Houston Texans are not a bad matchup to target. My guess is, I know Michael Thomas, you're going to be awaiting the news of. So I'm assuming I don't, Andre, I'm not going to influence him at all. My guess being that Chark has been on the bench before means that Chark is going to ride the bench yet again if Michael Thomas was to play. Then we have the defensive matchups. I think Washington at home against the Giants is a much better matchup than Denver. Uh, Denver gets to the quarterback, which is interesting without Vaughn Miller. This guy, Malik Reed, is somebody to keep an eye on. But at Atlanta, like Atlanta is not a team I attack for turnovers. It's just you attack them because of their defense and they're going to be in shootouts. So I'll leave it at that. Well, There are a lot of interesting plays on both sides of the field, but again, 
Look, I, I can't stress it enough. Can't stress it enough. If there's one person to win in a matchup where the two players go ag- under 100 points, Andre time and time again has won, like, I think every single one of those matchups. So this does look like another low-scoring affair. So I got to go with Andre yet again. Nope, no, no reverse jinx thing here. Allen seems just not quote-unquote healthy, and I don't like a lot of his his guys. So... Okay, I'm going to kind of speed through this since I know this is the next matchup that I want to talk about. There are some interesting pieces in the, in here between both of us. Let's kind of speed through it. Murray and Josh Allen look like they're going to be in matchups where they're going to have to throw the ball or be in competitive games. So I like that on both of our sides of the thing. DJ Moore, Tyler Lockett, Amari Cooper, Justin Jefferson. Cooper with whoever's throwing him the ball. It, it's, it's, it's a hard sight to see now without Dak. Jefferson's matchup looks good, but... Uh, this is the reason why I didn't like Minnesota pass catchers is if they ever take a lead, they're just going to run the crap out of the ball. DJ Moore, who knows at this point, it's it's literally seven points or 18. So it's, it's going to be one of those days. Lockett, the matchup looks fantastic for him. Um, if we're playing the pattern game, Metcalf went off, which means that it'll be a Lockett week this week. Obviously hoping for that. Justin Jackson and Chase Edmonds, a uh, thing to keep an eye on with Chase Edmonds. Kenyon Drake, they say his injury's not as bad. Justin Jackson, I do like, though, in, in a matchup against the uh, Vegas. Josh Jacobs, good matchup. Good matchup, not going to deny that. Um, LaMichael P. Ryan, uh, New England's pretty bad, so it could definitely happen. Hunter Henry's been a major disappointment. Uh, Jordan Reed, I don't even know why I have him, to be honest, man. I just needed a tight end for this week. Uh, so a draw between both of those guys. Corey Davis, who's been very, very solid and consistent this year, is finally getting a start on my roster due to bye week blues. Mike Williams is always a threat to score in any game. So you give him a jump ball opportunity, you can take it. Slayton, decent. I feel like Daniel Jones misses him all the time down the field. Tim Patrick, for the time being, is in my starting roster, but I don't know if he's going to get cleared for this game yet. Chicago against Tennessee, potentially a good spot. And Kansas City, also potentially a good spot whenever they're playing from – with a lead, excuse me. Um, so, obviously, I don't know what your lineup is going to be like. You haven't tweaked it at all. So, I don't want to jump to any conclusions with this matchup here. Uh, it'll be interesting. I know you're one in whatever, and this division really isn't the best. But I, I legit think that both these teams are kind of coin flip. I know it says that I'm projected to win, but who knows? Okay, I'm, I'm going to just come out here and, and, and say it. Uh, Be Magic, I know you think that your team is starting to have some depth, but <laughs> if not for 40 mile per hour gust wins and I have Derek Carr, I feel like you're feeling really nervous about your team. That's just me personally. So if I if I didn't see that weather report, I obviously would have went Derek Carr against you. I mean, putting up 80-some points, you never like to feel good about it, unless obviously the other team scores a little bit less. Uh, is this a bounce-back week? I don't know, man. Uh, there's a lot of things that I don't like on, on your roster. And even though David just lost, what's his name, George Kittle, there's still a lot of dangerous pieces here, but... David Cryer also has some guys that are starting to trend down, which I'll talk about. So Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady. Uh, I think Tom Brady at home with, with Antonio Brown could definitely win that one. Rod- Rodgers is fine, though. I don't think he's going to be a bad star, especially with no run game. He might have to throw a lot. Keenan Allen is a beast. Chase Claypool. This could be a game where he can score because this is a game where he doesn't have to do anything but run straight down the field. So I actually like him a lot. Juju he's not getting involved. Like this guy has been, Oh wow. He had 14 targets against the Titans. I did not see that. Well, the targets have been there. Interesting. So last two games, this guy's had 24 targets. This is kind of what you were expecting. I mean, you probably were hoping for a little bit. So Juju had like a two game skid, but when I look at the way I think they're using him, and this is just me thinking, when they're in extremely competitive games back and forth, I think they have to rely on him more. And I don't think he does anything against the Dallas Cowboys. So I actually don't like Juju. I think his best games are in competitive games. 
A Rob has been everything that you've hoped for. I know he's had two clunkers since you got him, but he'll be fine. Zeke Elliott is uh, honestly, this is me being perfectly honest with you. I try to move off of him immediately. Like, if there is anybody out there who thinks that he's still what Zeke Elliott should be, I'd, uh, before the deadline, this is a guy I would trade immediately. For it, uh, but I think the thing that sucks is you have Aaron Jones that's not healthy, but I, I'd get rid of Elliott in a heartbeat. Like, this is not going to be a guy that you want. For some depth, I would definitely unload him. Le'Veon Bell. I really thought the revenge game touched on against the Jets, but apparently this is not working out for him. Ronald Jones, Dalvin Cook. Dalvin Cook in a great spot. Ronald Jones, uh, taking time bomb. I, I warned you on this. This is a guy you had to sell high. Um, Arians does not like this guy. Can't trust him. But Dalvin Cook alone, I think, outscores both of his running backs. Can we cry? Rob Minkowski, eh. He's fine. He's touchdown or bust. Dolan Schultz. I loved him with Dak. I can't trust him at all. Cole Beasley. Decent matchup. I, I'll give you that against Seattle. Keelan Cole. I don't know what to think with this new guy throwing the ball. AP against Minnesota. It's a touchdown or bust. So these flexes, man, is where you guys are really hurting this week. Tennessee against Chicago. Maybe. Andy against Baltimore. Look, Lamar Jackson's a turnover machine this year. So... I'll give it there. My, my winner is kind of set right over here. If Dalvin Cook has a game like he did last week, man, uh, I think this one becomes a huge wrap because there's not enough firepower, especially without Aaron Jones healthy and Ezekiel Elliott not being Ezekiel Elliott. Be magic. If you are to pull an – I don't even know if you call it an upset, but I think Keenan Allen and Claypool have to go off because I think I really do like Claypool in this spot. Believe it or not, he is a guy that I think that has two touchdown potential because this is a game where if you can make Ben look like he's just throwing like deep balls easily, which this game would bode well for that, this is a this is a great spot. So I think that Claypool is a great option here. But I like Robinson, I like Brady, I like Cook. And I only know I know I only named three guys that I really like, but I think those guys have potential to be really good for David Cryer. So I got to go David Cryer. There is uh, probably an interesting matchup going on here. Um, I do think that if one of these teams loses, it doesn't affect the standings at all due to the higher point total. But Patrick is, it has been proving a lot of people wrong this year, including myself, including Johnny. I think Johnny had you ranked really low back in September. So what has really changed for this Patrick-led team? Travis Fulgham has become something. Brandon Ayuk is now getting forced into starter roles, which is great to see. He was a guy I was talking to Paul with to see if you wanted to deal him. But that's about it. Lamar Jackson hasn't been that great. Kamara's been fine, but you've had some running back issues, man. Uh, so it's, it's interesting how you're getting these points. I can't really explain it. It seems like there's one guy who kind of goes off. Coffee has dealt with a lot of injuries. Give it that. Now let's talk, call this game, which looks a lot closer than people might think. I, for one, am going Justin Herbert over Lamar Jackson. I think Justin Herbert is a lock for 20-plus every single week, reason being. Uh, they don't have any goal line backs because their running plays are too easy to kind of figure out. Since Austin Eckler has tore his hamstring, no Chargers running back has scored a rushing touchdown. Big facts. And I don't expect them to run. Even when they're at the goal line, they don't run the ball. And I think it's because their, line, their linemen haven't been healthy. So you're seeing more... Justin Jackson involved in the passing game, and now Tremaine Pope, which is why I picked him up. He is going to be also available. Like, their run game is these screens that they do very well. Uh, they design them very well. So, I think Herbert smashes. He is probably in my top three quarterbacks this week. I'm going to make a bold prediction and say he puts up 35. I, I just think that this is a back-and-forth affair where the defenses are a little leaky at the back end. Lamar is not what you paid for. Like, you you need a refund here, kid. Um, 
Indianapolis. I think they're an overrated defense, and I'll say that again. But Lamar Jackson can still at least, like, yikes, man. Like, these are some bad games. I, I got to go Herbert. Calvin Ridley might be questionable. Deontay Johnson, Brandon Ayuk, Mike Evans. Ayuk, love the usage. Don't love the matchup against Jair Alexander. Mike Evans, uh, he's going to get lost in the shuffle now, man. I, I don't trust him with Antonio Brown. Not saying Antonio Brown is going to be anything, but like I don't want any Tampa Bay passing option because the roles are undefined as we speak. Deontay should be fine. Hopefully he doesn't get hurt, but... Jesus, man. I, this situation is annoying. James Conner, Michael Hasty, Devin Singletary, Alvin Kamara. Kamara against the Buccaneers is going to get a lot of catches. So lock that in. James Conner, best matchup he'll see all year against Dallas. Book it. Uh, Jim Michael Hasty should be fine against the Green Bay Packers, but he's too touchdown dependent. Uh, worth the bid that you spent on him? Absolutely. But and then this this Packers defense sucks too, so he could probably get two touchdowns. Give me coffee side of things. Hawkinson over Hayden Hurst every day of the week. I'll flat out say that. Noah Fan. So you're going double tight end this week. Noah Fan against Atlanta is a good matchup. Good matchup if he's healthy. Rugs. I, I got news for you, man. Like I I respect that you're sticking with Henry Rugs. I do like this matchup though. I think this is a game where he gets three targets, catches one of them for 70 yards and a touch. Will Fuller, better matchup. Love it. Philip Lindsley, well, well, Coffee, we both said this, that his value is only if he breaks off a touchdown. He's done it two weeks in a row. Clearly the better runner than Melvin Gordon. I just hate relying on guys that have to break off like these insane runs to return value because he gets no catches. But it's the Atlanta Falcons. Should be a fun game for fantasy purposes. I'll go, I'll go the coffee side of things. Houston defense against Jacksonville. Ooh, nice streamer there. But Buffalo against Seattle. That's not a good matchup. Okay, I picked my winner based on matchups alone. I think when I'm looking at matchups, I think coffee, coffee has matchups beyond your wildest dreams, to be honest. I love it. Love it. Even if Ridley sits, this still doesn't change my mind. Patrick has a lot of bad matchups that I am not happy about, like to pick you in the, on the side of things. My bold prediction is this becomes the blowout of the week. Um, this is going to be one of those teams where if he starts winning, people are going to think maybe we should get on the coffee hype train. Um, if Calvin Ridley does suit up, this is going to be a big explosion, but I'm not going to go that far because I think Calvin Ridley sits. My final score prediction is going to be big face coffee, 152 and fake doctors 105. Okay, I really thought <clears throat> that this could have been the matchup of the week, but there is some uncertainty with this matchup. I think that this could be the matchup of the week, but first place is on the line when I'm talking about this matchup in particular. David, for the first time in since week two, week one, they finally dropped out of first place in his division. And the vintage one is on top, and I think you're probably going to be seeing that for the time being. Maybe, but a lot of things change, right? So the vintage one... You know, it's had some interesting pieces to move around. And now we're going to see a healthy David team with Patrick Mahomes, DeAndre Hopkins, and the return of Christian McCaffrey. Interesting. Interesting to say the least. Let's get into it. So, okay, I got a bone to pick with Harsh. Okay, you've had... All right. Your quarterback situation has not been ideal. Dropping Aaron Rodgers, I know you're an aggressive thinker and you're like, oh, quarterback doesn't matter. And, and to a point, that's, that's, that's okay. You're very fortunate that Derek Carr has been sitting on the waiver wire the whole year because he's having a tremendous year. And 
if you look at his numbers, don't factor in that win game. That's why I dropped him. He's been very, very serviceable. It's kind of like Derek Carr in a way, like, but it's a little bit more consistent. He's had four 20-point games, which is something that we're not used to seeing since his uh, sophomore sophomore year. And I honestly think that this is going to be your starter the rest of the way. So that's the way I see it. Um, he gets a very favorable matchup against the Chargers. Now, this game is probably one of my favorite games to stack as far as daily fantasy is concerned. And I think both these offenses are really fun to watch. Um, Chargers just fast paced this year with Justin Herbert taking over at the helm. And the Raiders just find unique ways for guys to get open. Um, anyway... We can't forget about the beast known as Patrick Mahomes at home against the Carolina Panthers. Needless to say, I still have to take Mahomes in this matchup. Um, anytime he takes the field. Last week, they were toying with the Jets. I think everybody who was watching that game kind of saw that. Derek Carr, I think, will have a decent game. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say Derek Carr, 26 points. Patty Mahomes, though, is, is 36. I think he has potential to be... He always has potential to be the number one quarterback, um, but he's definitely going to finish inside the top three this week. That, that to me, is a lock. Um, minor concern with Mahomes, Panthers are not good against the run. Uh, Brian Hill looked very serviceable last week. Gurley did not because Gurley sucks, but still finds ways to find it into the end zone, uh, which he needs to stop getting away with it because it's getting really freaking annoying. But um, last week they played the Jets, right? And he still threw it. It's fine. You have nothing to worry about. And the thing is that it's going to be little. This is more outside the brain thinking. With Le'Veon Bell being there, it kind of takes away Clyde Edwards Hilaire and his rhythm. So there's going to be more passing attempts. I don't think they're ever going to be able to establish these guys fully. There'll be decent fantasy options. But from an NFL standpoint, you're fine with Mahomes. Advantage David. Okay, Cardinals stack DeAndre Hopkins, Christian Kirk. And on the vintage side of things, my one of my favorite combos, although it hasn't been as explosive as I thought it would be, it's still probably my favorite combo in Tyreek Hill, Devontae Adams. So you've got the ultimate cock blocking piece in Tyreek Hill for Patrick Mahomes. So Carolina in the past has been bad against tight ends. Um, so this could shape up to be a Travis Kelsey game, but Tyreek Hill, the cheetah, is always a threat to go deep down the field. He has not been, I think... Last week, I think, was his most explosive game of the season, 23 points, which Tyree Kill in the past would have done a lot better, right? But he's had such a good floor. I think only Tredavious White has shut him down with just four points on the season. I don't expect that to, to happen against the Carolina Panthers, who were, you know, they're a mess defensively, I think. They have some interesting pieces in uh, Dante Jackson and uh, Jeremy Chin, but not nothing that should you be concerned about. Um, so I think he'll at least get one touchdown. So he'll take away one of the Mahomes touchdowns. Um, Devontae Adams tonight looks like he should have a field day against a really bad 49ers team against a Green Bay Packers team who, as of right now, as I'm recording, I have no idea if Aaron Jones even traveled with the team on a short week. But Dexter Williams and Tyler Irving are not going to receive any touches. So Devontae Adams is going to be probably the highest scoring skill position player in this matchup. Flip side of things between DeAndre Hopkins and Christian Kirk, this does not bode well for their matchups on the outside. If I am going to put my money on which one's going to bust, probably shapes up to be Christian Kirk. Um, Byron Jones is healthy. Xavier Howard, Xavier Howard does not shadow. Byron Jones does not shadow. But these guys operate on the perimeter where Larry Fitzgerald would be the guy to have the best matchup. But... We've seen time and time again that DeAndre Hopkins is a guy that can move all over the field. I expect King, Cliff Kingsbury to do that. Um, and I think it's potentially bad for Christian Kirk to be the sacrificial lamb. Um, the other thing that I think is going to happen with this game, with Kenyon Drake not being there, obviously it doesn't really matter as far as rushing touchdowns because Kyler Murray gets that. But my philosophy is with him in the backfield, there's going to be a lot more pass plays being called. So I think that the volume is going to be up for these guys because of that. There's going to be more passing situations than there is running situations. Hopkins should be fine. Christian Kirk would be the guy that I'd be I'd be shocked if he had a good game, to be honest, in this one. So, And especially with him splitting routes, but he still has his explosive role, which is what you like to see. 
but I easily have to go with the Tyree Hill Devontae Adams side, so I'll take Harsh. JD McKissick, okay, not a guy you really feel comfortable starting, and I'm assuming McCaffrey is going to be out there, which is going to be big, and especially in this matchup for first place. Um, do I expect Mike Davis to go away? No, but I'm not saying it's going to be a committee. I think McCaffrey will still get his usual role, and Mike Davis will be sprinkled in from time to time. Zach Moss finally, finally getting, I don't want to say the workhorse bell cow treatment, but his snaps have gone up, his carries have gone up. Singletary is still involved, but I think it's going to be only a matter of time. He's got the valuable touches on this team. James Robinson, again, I said RB1, and I'm, stick, so I'm sticking to it. I know he had two bad games in a row, but he really bounced back against the Chargers. Um, with the new quarterback coming in, I don't know if it downgrades him in particular. Uh, this guy has been really good at, anyway, all season with uh, Minshew. Um, I'm going to go with the harsh side of things in the running back spot. I think Zach Moss can probably fall into the end zone in a game that figures to be a back-and-forth shootout affair with two defenses that are really struggling. As far as James Robinson is concerned, the Texans' run defense, not very good. They're just not a very good team this year in general. Robinson's worst game of the season was against the Texans, so if you want to throw out the history card there, um, it was actually the first game where he fumbled, and then he wound himself on the bench in the third-slash-fourth quarter. My biggest concern with James Robinson, now that the Jaguars have all their backs healthy, is this a time where we're going to see somebody become a third-down running back if they fall from behind? I have no idea. So... There is a big question mark with that. Hold on, I just got an update on Christian McCaffrey. He's trending in the right direction. Okay, so I think all signs point to him playing unless he has a setback in practice. So even though McCaffrey is a dog, he's a beast, I don't know how effective he's going to be. So I'm going to steer on the side of caution because J.D. McKissick is the other one. Whereas I think Zach Moss and James Robinson have touchdown potential in this one. When I look at the tight ends, it is interesting because finally this guy is starting. Actually, he's not even... This guy has yet to... Dude, what is wrong with Evan Ingram? Like, this guy should be feasting, and he's not. He has yet to break double-digit points. Tight end sucks. Uh, Darren Waller is probably... Probably my favorite tight end option this week. He was last week until I saw 40-mile-per-hour wins, but uh, the Chargers are extremely vulnerable over the middle of the field without Duran James. Waller is a little concerning because he's not getting the target totals that he saw a year before, and that's because you're starting to see all these weapons around Derek Carr this year. Um, but he is still their best uh, pass-catching option, and it's not even close. I think every other receiver on this team is a, a bunch of role players where Darren Waller you can line up all over the field. Um, why I like him even more in this matchup is because Chris Harris Jr. is back, which means the slot. Casey Hayward's not shut down, but still respectable. So I think that Waller is going to be the guy. The Raiders are kind of easy to figure out when they're passing the balls, but I'm trying to tell you that they know where their weakness and an advantage is in matchups, and they take advantage of it when they can. It, again, it's a reason why I predicted Waller to go off week two against the New Orleans Saints. And what do you know? That happened. The best part about Waller, in a way, is with Henry Ruggs, defenses play a lot more deeper zones, which means he's going to be open underneath. That's why you're seeing him and Renfro still be kind of viable uh, this year. So give me Waller. Okay, this is why I got rid of both of these guys. Devontae Parker and Jameson Crowder. Well, uh, why the? Okay, hold on. Uh, AJ Brown and Trey Burton. Interesting double tight end strategy here, which I am definitely... Me being team uh, zero tight end, I am not a fan of that, but I don't like this offense bottom line with these pass catchers uh, with Tua at, at the helm. This is very, this is an annoying offense. I think they, I think Tua kills fantasy value of a lot of people except the running backs. <laughs> um, and with Gaskin not there, who knows? Parker might see Patrick Peterson. He might not. I have no idea how they're going to be doing this. Last week, I could have told you, but then Jalen Ramsey got... He left the game with an illness, which was weird in the middle of the game. Crowder's not going to play. Uh, I, I, I'd, I'd be shocked if they even keep this guy on the roster by the end of the season. They're just total tank mode, man. 
Uh, so I doubt he plays, which means that I have no idea who the hell you plug in. Watkins did return to practice as far as Wednesday was concerned. But I have not had any reports on him today. Parker, I just don't like. I don't think this is going to be an efficient offense to run. Uh, I just think it's going to be a very gadgety offense. Um, you're going to sound crazy. I know. And I think this affects Harsh more than... Well, actually, no. It affects both of you. This offense reminds me a lot of when Tim Tebow took over the helm in Denver. Uh, I just don't think there's any value. There's not enough volume to go around for Parker and Preston Williams. I, I have no idea. Like... We can't go off of last week because they didn't need to do anything offensively. So I think Parker's value is starting to trend down. Crowder's as well. A.J. Brown, you know, worst game of his career, not career, but one of the worst games of the season, man. But he is still uh, phenomenal. But what you're starting to see now is they are really starting to double team him, which is benefiting Corey Davis. So they are really taking away the stop and goes and the slants that he looks so explosive on. I hate this matchup. I, I really do for even Corey Davis. I have to start him this week. This Bears secondary has been very, very stingy. They have not given up a lot of big plays behind them. If they do, it's because of a busted uh, coverage deep down, down the field. Um, my guess is that A.J. Brown will not break free in this game. I expect that. It's, it's like what I said when Robbie Anderson was on fire. They shut him down, allowing D.J. Moore to get open, and I can kind of see the same thing. If they're going to leave a guy one-on-one, -on -one, it's going to be Davis, not A.J. Brown. So I'm really not big on that either, but because A.J. Brown is such a beast, I'm going to take the side of Harsh. Trey Burton in a double stack with... Waller as the tight ends. I have no idea what your thought process is with that, but it looks like Jonathan Taylor has hit the bench. He has looked abysmal. He's, he's looked he's looked so bad. He's him and David Montgomery. I think are the two running backs that have gotten a lot of volume and have just looked like crap doing it. He's looked bad. Uh, I don't expect Wilkins to be like amazing by any means, but you can't ignore what you're seeing on on tape. Tampa. New England, New England against the Jets normally would be fantastic, but this defense has not been good this year. They have not been good this year. I'll say that again. They look good against Vegas, though. But I have no idea who the hell is even active. They're, they're just not a dominant defense this year. Well, Christian McCaffrey changes a lot of things in this matchup. My prediction, because I think this is going to be a high-scoring affair, I think that Devontae Adams is the highest scoring skill position player. My God, this guy is an animal. Again, if you didn't have this guy ranked as your number one wide receiver coming into the year, I think you were falling victim into uh, expert rankings by ranking Michael Thomas when we clearly know that every time Devontae Adams is healthy on the field. Look at this. Look at this. In games, the guy has not been hurt. Okay? When he's not been hurt. 34 points. 38 points, 26 points. The nine-point game against Tampa, which was just very, very weird, was his only dud of the game. I think this has potential to be Devontae Adams' best game of the season. Sorry, David. You're going to have to live with that. Here's Harsh going, no, fuck you. Fuck you. Don't say that. Um, oh, I'm looking at Tyree Kill's stats. On first second, I was like, wait, why are they playing the Carolina Panthers? All right. Well, 38 is kind of tough to beat, so I don't know if he'll beat that. But, okay, maybe not 38 points. I'll say 35 points, though. I think he goes off, considering that he didn't run any, like, he didn't run any deep routes. <laughs> this is a game where I feel like Aaron Rodgers could go off. Uh, so, with that being said, I really like the pieces on the harsh side of things. Derek Carr driving a fancy car, the return. Uh, to Darren Waller connection is going to be very good. I think they combined for at least 40 points total. I think that's a nice matchup that they have going. The running backs, uh, the worst matchup, I think, on the harsh side of things, if I honestly want to nitpick on this team, is his flexes. I don't like them, but I really can't get behind David's flexes, considering I got rid of both of those guys. Um, yeah, if David is to kind of win this one, Patrick Mahomes has to have a five-touchdown game Realistically, one will probably go to Tyreek Hill. Hopkins has to be Hopkins, and McCaffrey's got to look beastly. 
but I think there's too many, too much firepower on Harsh's team. Uh, this is a team, like I said, in power rankings, I'm starting to buy. Uh, he's already re really leapfrogged the number two spot. And watch out if, if Paul's te team is slowly well, crumbling down. Uh, I think I'm putting in my ballot in Vegas rivalry. for this it's team to be the number one team. Up, this is going to be so my matchup of the week. Dude, but one. to be quite honest with you, I really, first glance, first glance, I'm not going to lie to you, I thought that this could have been a blowout. Really. Really thought this was going to be an ugly affair, but took a deep breath, went back and looked at it. So, Paul, this is now your second week in a row where you're on the matchup of the week column. So you will be getting the pro football focus matchup chart. And Johnny, of course, I think is going to love that. But look, I still think that this game can have a tendency to get out of hand at one point. Um, Paul has rebounded from a two game losing skid. Uh, so you can take a deep breath, Paul, everything's going to be okay. But then you got the news about Miles Gaskin, who was the definition of what you want your RB2 to be in just an RB2. Um, obviously a big blow. I did see you claimed uh, DeAndre Washington, which in theory, I think he could probably be the best backup for Gaskin. But I've seen time and time again that the Miami Dolphins just don't like any other guys. He can't, he's not eligible to play this week, by the way, with the rules. So if you are looking to start him, that's not going to happen. Um, but like this, this Dolphins backfield with now Brita being uh, questionable, it's going to be ugly this week, man. I, and the funny thing is that I wouldn't be shocked if they still won. Like, it could be that type of thing. Hold on, I got a notice on my phone. <laughs> Somebody just added Patrick Laird. Uh, that's what I got. So I just didn't want to make sure I didn't miss anything. All right, boys. We are now going to break down the matchup of the week. I will stop at one point to go into the wide receiver matchup charts, and you'll see a new screen when I highlight that. So... It's going to be a lot of fun. Let's get into it. Okay. Letting Russ Cook, who already has 26 touchdowns on the season. Amazing. And uh, Deshaun Watson against the Jacksonville Jaguars. Well, what do we know? Sean Watson is the definition of a really good quarterback on a really shitty team. But if it's a game where it's going to be a back and forth affair, he finds himself in garbage time where they're going to put up points. This does not seem like that's going to be the good script, but it is a Jacksonville Jaguars defense that's just been atrocious. They are slowly getting into tank mode. They are probably going to be in the running for Trevor Lawrence with the Jets and a few other teams. My biggest concern, because I'm going up against him this week, is that this could potentially be a David Johnson game. If we recall, the Texans never lost a lead against the Jaguars, and David Johnson actually hit over 100 yards on the ground which is gross just thinking about that. But Watson was only bad in the first three weeks of the season, right? 22, 16, 21, which, which isn't even that bad. Like, So I think Johnny did the, did the best buy low opportunity he could. So kudos to Jay on that. And you know, I'm never a hater on Watson. I just, I absolutely hate his, his weapons. Count your blessings, Jay, because Will Fuller did not get dealt. If Will Fuller got dealt, your team would be a uh, uh, red flag, like panic mode. Really bad. I, 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 I probably, I said this, but I'm not going to say it. We'll, we'll wait. If you lose this week, I'll say it. But, um, right there within, um, against the Buffalo Bills. Look, doesn't matter. This guy's going to cook. Um, Carson, I don't think he's going to play. DJ Jalis, I know, is on the injury report. Um, but he should be fine if he's the only guy there. Uh, he had the highest snap percentage share. Uh, Russell Wilson against the Buffalo Bills. He's going to cook. Um, who am I taking between these two guys? I think Watson is fine. Do I see a 35-plus point game out of Deshaun Watson? I'm going to say no. And the reason being is I, I think they just killed the Jacksonville Jaguars. But, <laughs> again, but, uh, you know what? He's not going to be a dud by any means. I'll say Watson, 28 points. Russell Wilson, 36. Um, okay. One of the main reasons... Oh, wait, no, we can't talk about receivers yet. I forgot. We got to go on running backs. Okay. Uh, Derrick Henry, Damian Harris. I saw that you made that trade, and I kind of raised my eyebrow a little bit about that. So, Claude edward the Lear. Jarek McKinnon. Okay. Jarek McKinnon with Nick Mullins, I feel like, is going to be actively involved considering who their receivers are going to be. By the way, Paul, you're a big prop bet guy. I have not checked the lines, but 
Uh, I would take the over on Richie James receiving yards. I think he has the most explosive potential out of any of the receivers. He's got a good coach. That would be the guy I would take the over with. And Johnny, I know you're pissed because you had Kendrick Bourne. Time for another. Uh, we'll save that conversation for another time, though. Um, okay, lost my train of thought. Clyde Edwards Hilaire. Um, it's a little bit concerning since Le'Veon Bell has come into uh, Kansas. 12 points, 4 points. It's cutting into him, and I know Johnny's going to take his victory lap on that. Whatever. Um, it's a favorable matchup, but like I told David when I was doing the Mahomes matchup, this guy only had six rushing attempts last week. Now he's going against Carolina, which is a good matchup. But this volume is concerning. He's slowly, slowly, slowly dropping. He's no he's no longer an RB1. The volume alone can't hold him there. And now I think he's probably falling down into that boom or bust RB2 role. You're banking on a touchdown or bust here, kid, and I don't think that the Chiefs want to run the ball, so I think you're looking at eight points out of Clyde edwards Alaire. Jarek McKinnon, on the other hand, I think is going to get a lot of volume in the pass game role. I think Hasty takes over. I think he does a fine job running the ball, but Jarek McKinnon will be involved. They only want to like they don't want to over abuse him, but I think at this point, what choice do you have? Uh, Nick Mullins is going to be throwing to the combination of Trent Taylor, Richie James, some other guy. I know Kevin White, blast from the past there. And Jordan Rude. Uh, so um, I'll take I'll take Jarek McKinnon uh, as your highest scoring running back, which I don't know how you feel about that, but it is what it is. Johnny side of things. Derrick Henry. This is not the best matchup for him. He's going to be, as he always is, touchdown or bust kind of guy. Do I think he's going to have a 30-point game? No. Is he going to be a bust? No. So in between 30 and 0, I'll say 19 points. You'll take it. What is his projection? 16? Okay, so he over that. Damian Harris. Look, I never want to own New England backs. He broke away a long run against the Buffalo Bills. And since he's had rushing attempts, right, since he's been healthy, only one game he's not had double-digit carries. And a game where they're projected to lead, I think he falls into the end zone, as gross as that sounds, 15 points. <clears throat> Travis Kilsey. I actually think he has another big game for you. So two touchdowns, mark it. Mark Andrews. Uh, talk about bust. This is why you do not. I repeat, this is why you do not take tight ends early. Um, yeah. It's a shame that he has a running back throwing him the ball, Johnny. It's just a, it's just a harsh truth. Indianapolis, all right? They've been, on paper, the best defense. To me, they are still probably the most overrated defense in the league because their stats have been skewed by... Minnesota Vikings, the New York Jets, the Chicago Bears. Who else have they played that's pretty shitty? But listen to the teams that have actually, like, found ways to beat them, right? Jags, Minshew-led Jags, I may remind you, who's now benched. And the Joe Burrow-led offense and the Browns to an extent. I mean, that was kind of a weird game. I know Kareem Hunt had a great game on that one, so I'm not taking too much into consideration as far as calling them elite, but I'm still a little bit concerned with Mark Andrews. Like, he doesn't have a floor this year. He's literally, like, what a tight end should be, if you're asking me. Like, <laughs> wow. Uh, I, I gotta go Kelsey. Okay, I'm gonna pause this segment. We're gonna go into uh, the pro football focus matchup short.
All right, so you're staring at it right now. Here is the matchup chart that I'm going to use to kind of give you an in... Uh, what am I want to say? A more in-depth approach to the matchup of the week since it is deserving. And I know Johnny right now is probably like taking screenshots all over the place trying to find that one, one guy. So, all right. <clears throat> so starting on Paul's side of the ball... He is starting a Buffalo Bill wide receiver, Stephon Diggs. And let's talk about, is John Brown in your in your starting line? All right, so we'll talk about both the Bills receivers. So Seattle's defense has been really, really bad, okay? Um, if you look at Stephon Diggs, okay, I'm going to kind of, if you can see my screen, lines up on the left side of the field 29% of the time, slot percentage 33% of the time, right percentage 38% of the time, which is pretty balanced, which is what you want to see in an elite alpha receiver. This is this, what this pretty much means, guys, is that they're using them all over the field to avoid shadow-based coverage and avoid mismatches of any kind. Now, he's probably, in my estimation, going to see more of Lyndon Stevens and Quentin Dunbar. Uh, it is so funny that they don't even have Trey Flowers listed on here, which is the guy you want to attack. Um, I don't think he's gotten benched by any means. I just don't know why he's not even listed here, but <laughs> that's funny. Uh, Diggs has like a minimal advantage. Dunbar has been the better of the Seattle corners, but Dunbar has also been on the second string team. Okay. What I mean by that is DJ Reed Jr. is their permanent slot guy, nickel guy. Trey Flowers, I think, is in and out of the lineup constantly, so that's probably why he's not listed here. Um and Shaquille Gr Shaquem or Shaquille Griffin, whatever one, the cornerback, he, I think, is still dealing with some type of injury, which should bode well, bode well for some of these outside guys. Uh, Diggs should get probably his highest target share of the season. I would expect at least 16-plus targets to Stephon Diggs in this one. Um, I love this matchup. I honestly think that this is Paul's highest scoring player of the week this week. I just think that they're going to be in catch-up time. This is a big game for Josh Allen. Like, I still don't believe, Johnny, that he's had a signature win, uh, unless you want to count Dak on Thanksgiving. But, like, Dallas isn't an impossible. Like, Dallas is a joke. Whether they're good or bad, they're a joke. Paul's probably laughing when he just heard that right now. Let's talk about the guy you're starting, Johnny, John Brown. Now, as I am recording this, does he not have an injury designation? I don't know. I have not heard anything about John Brown, but this is a guy I'm extremely concerned about. The advantage they're saying is going to Lyndon Stevens, meaning that John Brown uh, advantage is negative 31%. They are factoring in the fact that he's hurt, of course. If you give me a healthy John Brown against Lyndon Stevens, give me John Brown, but he has not looked the same since the injury. I know this looks like a match of where he can take advantage, but if I'm going to think outside the box... If he can't sprint down the field and is constantly having these injuries, Gabe Davis could pop off for a big game here as well. I just can't get behind and hurt John Brown. I mean, Johnny, I know you're hoping for it, but look at his game. I think he came back. The Vegas game, I think, was his first game back. Then he re-injured himself, did not play in the Tennessee game, did not play, or did he play in the Kansas? Oh, he did play in the Kansas City game. got nothing. Jets game. Probably didn't play in that one. Yeah, he definitely didn't. New England game. Too, like, he's just not healthy, man. Uh, Beasley has been really, really solid stepping up for the number two role. And, and Gabe Davis is starting to get pushed a little bit more because he's not healthy. Very concerned here. So I'm actually going to have to side with Paul on the Buffalo Bill receiver. Now let's go and filter in the Tampa Bay Buccaneers matchup between you two. It's funny that you guys got receivers on the same side. Well, Johnny, Antonio Brown has not been least listed in the database, but I'll tell you what I'm going to be expecting. We can cross off and neither is Chris Godwin. So actually both of you are kind of fucked, but, but uh, Godwin will be seeing Chauncey Gardner Johnson, who is a joke. So Godwin, if he gets the volume, that's a big if because I have no idea what it's going to be will man up the slot. He'll go against Cha Chauncey Gardner-Johnson. Should be fine. Scotty Miller on the right side of the field. That's where AB is going to probably line up. Um, I think this guy gets eased in, though, Johnny. You have to start him no matter what. I get it. Uh, we're all dealing with some stuff. So, hey, 
I get it, man. I get it. No, nobody's blaming you. Nobody's blaming you. But he just might be a guy who's going to be used on certain drives, and then he sits back on the bench and does Antonio Brown things. Who knows what that's going to be? But uh, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to actually make a bold take here. I think he scores a touchdown. Like mentally, they want to get this guy right, and I think by giving him a touchdown, whether it's a 12-yard touchdown, 50-yard touchdown, or two-yard touchdown on like a jet sweep or something like that. He wants to feel welcomed, and I think the best way to do that, and by the way, this is Tom Brady's team, not Bruce Arians' team. So whatever Tom says, Tom is going to get that. So bold prediction, I think Antonio Brown gets a touchdown, but it's not going to be like a, oh my good, like 50-point game. I'll say Antonio Brown gets like 14 points. Paul side of things, Godwin, ah, this looks like a good matchup against the Saints, as it should be. Mike Evans, I just don't like. I think I think we can kind of all agree uh, where you guys can kind of find a middle ground is that the one guy who's probably going to suffer is Mike Evans. So with that being said, though, God, God, when I think is like 10, 12 points, you'll take it. Uh, so actually, by that judgment, I might have to go Antonio Brown because I think he gets a touchdown. All right, we're gonna save the best for last because I want to see Paul on on the. I want to I want to hear his reaction. Let's go down to on filter and by team, Minnesota and Johnny's boy Adam Thielen. Let's check that matchup. All right, Adam Thielen is going to get Jeff Okuda, who has not been very good in his rookie campaign. Uh when you see a big green number like that on the advantage, fifty seven percent advantage going to Adam Thielen. But I love I love me some Justin Jefferson J, but. It's not the matchup that I'm concerned with. It's the fact that this is going to be a game where they're going to be up. And this is why I didn't like Adam Thielen. No, it is not that I think he is an overrated receiver. Thing I Again, I sound like a broken record. I don't think he's elite in terms of fantasy. I don't think he can be considered as a complete number one for fantasy. And the second knock I had on Thielen is not because of his talent. It's because if Minnesota gets in games where they don't have to throw, such as this one coming up, he's not going to do anything, just like that happened last week. This is the Dalvin Cook show this week yet again. So with that being said, Adam Thielen will probably put up another dud for Jay for like eight points. Okay? Sorry, but that's what I think is going to happen. <laughs> oh, Johnny's like, I can't wait for him to get rid of. All right. Paul, your biggest news of – did I miss any receivers? Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, Carson is in your starting lineup. Okay, if Carson will be fine. I, I'm sorry, I missed that, but uh, I missed Jerry Judy. Let me get to Jerry Judy before we get into the big one, Paul. Jerry Judy. Um, As of right now, the Denver Broncos listed database. The They only have the healthy guys here. Deshaun Hamilton, Jerry Judy, KJ Hamler. These guys have looked abysmal. Yes, even Jerry Judy has not looked that good. I don't think you know you can say it's Drew Locke. He's had a lot of drops this year. Believe it or not, the Atlanta cornerbacks have turned it around once Raheem Morris has kind of stepped up. Yeah, it's true, guys. It kinda is. I think the only since the only receiver to go over hundred yards against them has been Galladay. Uh they've played much better. Am I buying it? <laughs> no. Uh, but I don't expect Jerry Judy, though, to have a breakout game here. On paper, it looks good. But especially with Tim Patrick coming back, yeah, not buying it. Uh, Judy, I'll say 10 points, which is wishful thinking at best, I think. The tight ends are where you want to attack the Atlanta Falcons now. Uh, Falcons suck, don't get me wrong, but I, I can't get behind Judy. All right, now, Paul, moment you've been waiting for Okay, well, Paul, two weeks ago it was a Lockett week. Metcalf didn't do anything. Last week it was a Metcalf week and Lockett didn't do anything, which means don't say it. Yeah, this is going to be a Lockett week, bro. Even ask my man Jay who follows the Buffalo Bills. There you go. Metcalf will definitely see Tredavious White. Tredavious White, I think, Jay, I haven't watched a lot of Bills film, but I feel like he hasn't been involved in a lot of shadow situations because they haven't had teams with an elite wide receiver to shadow. If I'm not mistaken, Mr. J, let me just t check. Jets, no alpha on the outside. Dolphins, he shadowed. Preston Williams, he didn't do anything. Rams, you can't shadow because they move them around too much. 
Vegas does not have an elite receiver on the outside. A.J. Brown did well against him, I think. Yeah, he did. Kansas, Tyreek Hill didn't do anything. Uh, Jets again, no elite. New England, no elite. So he hasn't really been asked to shadow. This is the, his toughest matchup, Tredavious White against the machine, D.K. Metcalf. Now, okay. A.J. Brown had a good game against Tredavious White, and we know that both A.J. Brown and D.K. Metcalf are from Ole Miss. They are guys that are built like animals. And I think that D.K. won't get uh, taken out of this game completely. But ask Johnny about Teron Johnson. Johnny will, I can see it right now. Paul, deal with the fact that it's going to be a lack it week, okay? I know how bad Teron Johnson is. And looking at the matchup chart, Lockett has a 29% advantage against Teron Johnson if he gets targeted. I honestly just think that they go into the huddle and they know, look, Metcalf, this is your vacation. Lockett, you have to do work today and then you get the week off next week or something like that. It's just, it's just hilarious how they're doing all this. Um, slowly but surely, though, you're seeing David Moore get a little bit more involved, too. So he seems to be the guy who's going to probably just end up with eight points every week while the other two kind of just do their thing. It'll be nice to see if both of them can have a week on the same week, though. I think that would be cool. Uh, so, yeah. All right, now time to pick a winner. Is it a landslide victory? No. Is it a blowout? No. So... Russ will cook. Watson will be fine, though. But I honestly can't get behind. Johnny's receivers are going to let him down. Every single one of them. Judy, no. John Brown, no. He's just not healthy. Thielen, I, I, it's not that he's going to look bad. It's just that I think Dalvin Cook. And once the Vikings have a lead, they're not throwing the ball. And Antonio Brown will be okay, though. But Diggs and Metcalf. Well, Diggs will be good. Metcalf, Metcalf is a coin flip. Uh, Godwin, okay. Can DJ Dallas start again for... Uh, I almost called you harsh. I'm, I apologize for Paul. No. I'm just kidding. He can. I just think that Paul's receivers are much safer than Jay's, but Jay's running backs are in better spots. So this is why I, it gets tricky now. So then I think it comes down to me to look at the tight ends, and I got to go Kelsey. Oh, wait a minute. Forgot about the X factor. Paul, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I totally missed this. This game is actually closer than I thought. Pittsburgh against Dallas could be nasty. Sorry, Paul. Uh, Ravens D is not good anymore. They're like, okay. For fantasy, I mean. Totally glanced over that Pittsburgh game, which makes me want to stop and think a little bit. Whew, this is actually tougher than I thought now because the, we've seen time and time again Defenses winning t people matchups. Coffee beat me with Indianapolis getting 30 plus points. I beat Paul. Don't mention it. Uh, I got it. I got it. Um, I like Diggs, though. I think Diggs is going to be nice. You know what? You know what? I got to keep the same energy, though. I think Pittsburgh D is going to be nice, but like I, Johnny, I've, I've said this, told you this a million, million times, million, million times. Having Eckler and, and Mostert is going to kill your team, and it's because your receivers aren't that. Like, if Antonio Brown becomes something, I think you become serviceable yet again. But I can't get behind this, man. Like, I can't get behind these receivers. Uh, so I got to go Paul. I think the only thing I can guarantee you is that Paul's guys will see the field when healthy. I have no idea, like, if your guys are going to be used as decoys or not, Johnny. So it's too much of a coin flip for me. Uh so I got to go, Paul. And the final score will be, uh, it'll be one, 132, Paul. Not, not explosive outburst because I think the running backs kind of lower your upside a bit to Johnny's 117.